Hello, students of statics, it's Dr. Dan Baker. And in today's video, we're gonna continue with our discussion of area moments of inertia. And I wanted to start here with just a reminder that you've seen these equations before. You actually saw the equations for moment, area moments of inertia back in the centroids chapter. And they are over here on the far um, right-hand side of the centroid and moments of inertia table, okay? so. Each one of these shapes has its own moments of inertia. Now, let me just highlight here that there's two sets of equations uh, for most of these shapes. We'll start here with the square. Okay, so um, for the square, anything with a bar above it, I bar um, sub X or I bar sub Y, these bars will always be of or about the centroid. Okay, and so that centroidal axis is here coming through in the middle here of this square. And so if you want to find the moment of inertia of that square and about the centroid, you can go ahead and use the 1 12th BH cubed or 1 12th B cubed H. Notice that the different term here is cubed. The way you can always tell which one's gonna be cubed is the one that is the distance away from your desired axis. Okay, your IX bar is basically around this X axis here through the centroid. And so I'm gonna get a greater area moment of inertia the more material I have away from that axis, basically. So the taller this is, the greater the H will increase my moment of inertia in a nonlinear way, right? Actually a cubic, while the width, if I add a double width, so I double my base here, I'm just going to double my moment of inertia uh, about that X axis. And then it's a flip for your Y axis, okay? Because it's looking at a greater distance away from um, the centroid, okay, horizontally. Now these other equations here are based upon, let me just highlight these. So these were the red ones. And then we also have these here. We'll do these in brown, okay? So they're going to be about this other axis here along the bottom and the left edge. Now, what you'll notice is 1 12th is smaller than 1 third. You know, the other, the other terms in the equation are exactly the same, right? BH cubed and B cubed H. So fundamentally, the moment of inertia of any shape about its own centroid is going to be smaller than the moment of inertia about any other axis. Okay, so as we move away from the centroid, we get a bigger and bigger moment of inertia. And it turns out the way that we can go from um, essentially these equations in the red to the equations down in the brown, it's called the parallel axis theorem. Okay, so let me just write that here. Um, the parallel axis theorem. And since we're already talking about it, let's go ahead and write out those equations. And so we can say for our parallel axis theorem equations that Ix, now this is the moment of inertia about some desired axes, and this is the composite parts version, is equal to the summation of all the different parts, all the different subbodies of our moment of inertia about the centroidal x axes plus the area of each subshape times y bar of the element squared. Okay, so again here, we're going to add up the moment inertia of each subbody about its centroid, and then add on the area of each subshape times the vertical distance squared. And this vertical distance, of course, is from your desired axes to the centroid of your subshape. And then the parallel equation for i, y, i, y is equal to the summation of my i bar sub y's plus my a x bar of my element squared. Okay, so one cool thing about these two equations versus the equations that we used in um, for centroids is that centroids you always had to divide your first moment of area divided by your total area. Right, remember that form like it was a numerator and denominator and you had to compute both of those. The great thing about moments of inertia is all you're doing is adding up the moment of inertia of each subbody, and you don't have to divide by anything. Okay, there's no denominator in your computation. The other great thing is that in this equation here, um, you'll see that all of our um, distances are gonna turn out to be squared. Okay, so y bar sub el squared and x bar sub el squared. And so if your distances are squared, it doesn't matter if they're positive or negative distances. Once you square them, they'll turn out to be positive terms. Okay, so that is your parallel axis theorem equation. And this is the equation that we'll use to compute the moment of inertia for composite parts.
okay, a system made up of a bunch of subbodies. And so back over here to our table, we have equations for triangles and circles and half circles and quarter circles. And the areas are still listed here as well as the centroidal distances from the lower left corner because you need all of those values, right, in order to compute with your, comp with your parallax theorem. Now notice here for half circles and quarter circles, I've given you a decimal equivalent to this term up here that includes pi. Now the reason I do that is because I see a whole bunch of students who make errors in computing this. This is kind of long, right? 8 divided by pi minus 8 divided by 9 pi. They forget some vital parentheses or the order of operations and they get the wrong answer. So these are decimal equivalents to the um, exact fractions above. All right, so here is the example problem that we are going to work through. We are first going to find the area moment of inertia ix and iy about the given axes. Okay, here's my x axis and here is my y axis. Next, we're going to find the moment of inertia of the shaded area about its own centroid. Okay, so we'll need to find that centroid. It is currently not designated. And I'll talk you through there's actually two different ways of doing that, um, one which is a bit shorter than the other. Okay, so the first thing we need to do in any centroid or moment of inertia problem is recognize what parts that we can carve this um, shape into. I have chosen three parts. Um, you could choose more, but I think that it's easiest to go with the fewest parts possible. I've chosen a rectangle, a positive rectangle, which is there. We're going to call that shape number one. I've chosen a triangle, which the triangle is over here to the left-hand side of the yellow rectangle. And then I have chosen a cutout quarter circle, this two meter radius quarter circle right here. Okay, and so again, this is going to be shape one, shape two, and shape three. Now, I tend to work these problems with a table just because I think it's a really good way to get all of your information organized within that table and just you know take a look at all your signs, positives and negatives, and, and do everything else. But you do need to show some work, okay? And so I'll leave it up to you exactly how you show some work. I'll show you what I think would be appropriate level of work here on this problem. And the first thing to do would just be to write down the equations you're going to use, right? So... Um, if I go over to my table and I look at the equations for a rectangle, noting that we're going to compute both ix and also iy. So for a rectangle, I have equations that tell me that i bar sub x is equal to bh cubed over 12. And my i bar sub y is equal to b cubed h over 12. Right, the x term is always going to be more reliant on a bigger height, that's distance away from the x-axis. The y term is going to have a greater width, or basically more reliant on the width. Okay, and then for my triangle, which this triangle is kind of upside down, we have the equations that my i bar sub x is equal to bh cubed over 36. And then my i bar sub y is going to equal to b cubed h over 36. And then finally, for my quarter circle, and so this quarter circle, so one fourth circle, has equations that x bar is equal to y bar, as long as in this case I'm measuring from this lower corner down here. Right, so in the table, we always measure things from that 90 degree corner. And these terms are equal to um, four times r over three times pi, or its decimal equivalent. And it turns out that my i bar x is also equal to my i bar y. And that is equal to the decimal equivalent 0 0.055 r to the fourth. Okay. Notice that all these terms from moment of inertia have basically total lengths to the power of four. Okay. That also tells you that our units for these area moments of inertia are going to be length to the fourth. Okay. So meters to the fourth, centimeters to the fourth, feet to the fourth, inches to the fourth. So we're often going to end up with pretty large numbers compared to the original dimension of our system. All right. So there are my fundamental equations. Now let's go ahead and set up a table. So my table is going to have a whole bunch of columns. 
Uh, I'm actually gonna make a table here with um, one table or one column. I'm gonna do all this in gray. My gray's a little skinnier. So the number of my shape, we're gonna go with the area of the shape. Now we're gonna find the distance to each subshape centroid in the X direction, in the Y direction. I have my second moment of area, which is my area X bar sub EL squared area x bar e l oh this is the y bar sorry about that y bar e l squared and then i need to compute my moment inertia about the centroid of each subshape i bar sub x i bar sub y and then because i'm going to compute my centroid i'm going to have an a x bar e l and an a y bar e l Okay, similar to centroids, most of these columns are more computational than geometric. Okay, so it turns out really only the first, you know, after we number them here, right, one, two, and three, only um, area x bar el and y bar el are fundamentally geometric terms, right, based upon where your axis is. Everything else is more kind of equation based or computational. And so if I take a look first at my rectangle, right, vertical rectangle, four meters in height, two and a half meters in width, of course, 2.5 times four is equal to 10. Okay, so, and here if you wanted to, you could put your units up top here. This is gonna be meters squared. Both of these are gonna be in meters. I guess I should put those in brackets instead of making it look like I'm multiplying there. Um, everything else as we go, actually these four here, these are all going to be in meters to the fourth. And the last two columns here are going to be in meters squared. Okay, so that will be our units for everything. So looking at the distance to the centroid of this rectangle from my given axes. Okay, because the y-axis sits here along the left-hand side, I basically can just take a base over 2 to find its centroid. Let me just draw the centroid on here. Right, it is centered here, 2 meter radius, yeah, 4 meter height. So here is, I call this g sub 1, the centroid of my rectangle. And so horizontal distance is going to be half of the width. So I can write here, give me a screen reset here. Um, so this is going to be two and a half divided by two. So that's 1.25 and a horizontal distance over to G1. And then vertically, I essentially have zero because the centroid of that rectangle sits upon the x-axis, so no vertical distance to the centroid. I'm gonna go ahead and complete these areas and these other terms here before I move on to the terms over to the right. So for my triangle, keep in mind that the distance to the center of a triangle is gonna be the base divided by three. Now that base divided by three is always gonna be from the right triangle corner, okay? So the base is two divided by three is going to be two thirds. So the value there is going to be um, 2 divided by 3. This is equal to 0 0.66 or 2 thirds. Oh, sorry, I put that in the wrong column here. That is my x bar. Keep things organized. My area, of course, is 1 half base times height. So I have 1 half, let me actually write it this way, base is 2. Height is four divided by two. Twos cancel, I end up with positive four meters squared for my area. So there is my X bar sub EL. My Y bar sub EL, you can think of a couple different ways. One way, if you wanted to, you could add the two meters to get up top here and then subtract off the height divided by three, right? Again, measuring from the right triangle corner. So I could write this one if I wanted to as um, two plus Actually, let me flip this plus two minus four divided by three. And so this turns out to be um, a positive 0 0.666. Now, one error that I just noted that I made is that I need to include the sign on these X bar and Y bar ELs. We found out how important that is when we're looking at centroids. And so the sign here 
on my x bar EL, because it's a distance of negative 2, this would be negative 0 0.666. Of course, you could round that if you wanted to, 667. And then last, looking at my quarter circle, let me just move this down a touch. So the quarter circle has a radius of 2, and so this is going to be pi times 2 squared. And it is a quarter circle, so divided by four, right? Four quarters and a full. And so this, the two squared and the four end up canceling, and we end up with an area here, negative 3.141, carry it out a little further, one six. And then the distance, the horizontal distance to its centroid is going to be the two and a half minus four r over three pi, right? Backing off from this corner here. So two and a half horizontal distance from the y-axis to the far side. So this is going to be 2.5 minus 4 times 2 divided by 3 times pi. And that's going to be a positive value. The positive value is 1.6512. And then to do the same thing here, to find the vertical distance, I'm going to subtract 2 to come down to the bottom add back in my 4r over 3 pi. So this would be a minus 2 plus 4 times 2 divided by 3 times pi, which works out to be a negative 1.151. Add in some column separations here. Not quite straight, but they'll work. On to the more arithmetic parts of the table. Fundamentally now it is multiplying my area times now the square of my um, centroidal distances. Um, here for the rectangle, we end up with values of 15.625 and then a zero, zero because zero squared is still zero. And then multiplying for my triangle, the positive area of 4 times the um, negative x bar EL, but I'm going to square that term, right? So the negative will go away. So we end up with a positive 1.778 because I have the same value, just the flip of the signs, but again, the square of negative 0.66 and the square of positive 0.66 is the same value. So this is also 1.778. And for the quarter circle, I have that negative area. So the negative area times a positive 1.6512 squared gives me a negative 4.163. And then doing the same thing for my y bar sub EL, squaring that term, I get a negative 0 0.880. All right. So again, those are just arithmetic multiplying these previous columns to build these terms here. So we also need to find the moment inertia about the centroid of each shape. And so we came up with our equations there earlier, right? The base, in this case, we always measure base horizontal and height vertical in the context of these equations. So my Ix is equal to I bar x is 13.33, which is going to be my base of 1.5 times my height of 4 cubed divided by 12. And then moving for my triangle, I have my base times height cubed divided by 36 equal to 3.5. 556. And then for my quarter circle, I'm going to have the same value here for both x and y, negative 0 0.880. Oh, I just caught a computational error as I was transcribing from my notes. And possibly if you were computing along, you found this. And it turns out that this value here and this value here I copied incorrectly. So um, let me just talk through what I did. I basically shifted these values over one column. And so it turns out that this squared times pi 
is equal to the 4.163. So this should be the negative 4.163. And then for these ones, multiply again negative pi times the square of 1.6512 gives me a slightly larger value of negative 8.565. Okay. Fundamentally, a greater distance away from the y-axis, hence a little bit bigger um, shift in its moment inertia from the parallel axis theorem. All right, so that's those terms. I bar sub y for my rectangle is 5.208. I bar sub y of the triangle, 0.889. Same value here for my quarter circle as I had for x, 0 0.880. And again, these are all coming from the I bar sub y equation. This equation, this equation, and that equation. All right, and then the last two terms here, um, again, just focus on finding my centroid. Where is that centroid? So bringing those values in the area times x bar EL, and these are going to be subject to the positive and negative values of x bar EL and y bar EL. Okay, so 10 times 1.25 is equal to uh, positive 12.5. 10 times zero is zero. Uh, 4 times negative 0.666 is going to be a negative 2.667. 4 times positive 0.666 is going to be positive 2.667. And then for the quarter circle, negative pi times a positive distance here gives me a negative 5.187. And then negative pi times a negative distance gives me a positive 3.617. Okay, adding my columns in here. All right, so there are all the different terms I need, all the different numbers to compute my sums. Okay, and so the summations I need to compute in this problem, I need a summation of my areas. I need a summation of both of these columns right here. I need a summation of my I bar X's, a summation of my I bar Y's. I also need summations of these two columns to find my centroid. Okay, so summations of everything except for the X bar EL and Y bar EL. So some of my areas is a positive 10.858, right? Total areas in meters squared. Some of the second moment of my area this is 8.838. Summation of my second moment of area for um, y bar, so this is about the x axis, is a negative 2.385. Summation of my i bar x's is an even 16.0. Summation for my I bar Y's is 5.217. Summation of my first moment of area um, is going to be 4.646. And summation of my first moment area um, in the Y direction is going to be 6.283. All right, lots of bookkeeping, almost there. So now we need to go ahead and apply our equations. Okay, so we know that our moment inertia about the given x-axis is equal to the summation of all of the i bar sub x's plus shifting them because of their distance from the x-axis, and so that is area y bar of the element squared. Okay, so just numbering these, um, this is going to be, make sure I label these right, that this is going to be 1 and... This is going to be two, okay? So here's one and two. And so this is equal to a value for X of 13.62 meters to the fourth, right? Adding together 16 minus 2.385. Uh, next up, we have our I, Y. And it is going to be the summation of all of my i bar sub y's, 
plus my area times y, excuse me, not y in this case, x, x bar of my elements squared. And so for this one, I'm going to add up uh, this one here, 3 and 4. Okay, so this is 3 and this is 4. So adding those values together, 5.217 plus 8.883. Touch larger value here, 14.05 meters to the fourth. And then over here, using our centroid, we can find that the distance to the centroid from the given axes, x bar, is the summation. We'll keep our labeling scheme here going. Let's call this one 5, 6, and 7 for our areas. And so this is fundamentally going to be 5 divided by 7. And so um, dividing my first moment area by sum of areas, I end up with 0 0.43, that's positive. And then y bar um, is also positive because I have, this is going to be my summation of my first moment, six divided by summation of areas, seven. And this value is 0 0.58 meters. Again, because centroids are spatial, always worth looking at those. And so if I wanted to plot these, I could come back to my diagram and see, see 2.5, somewhere in there. And so my question is, is does that centroid seem to make sense? And you think, well, yeah, I think that would make sense. Looks like about the overall center of the area being close to a half meter to the right of the y-axis and around a half meter above the x-axis. So those, those make sense. So the last step we have is part B, right? We've solved essentially for part A. We found this moment inertia about the given axes. Now we want to shift these to the centroid, okay? So shifting these to the centroid, you could do it in two different ways. One is you could reproduce a whole other table, excluding these last two columns here because you wouldn't, well, you'd need to know where it was to start with, but fundamentally you'd base your x bar EL and y bar EL on these centroidal values, right? Where is your centroid? The other way to do it is to apply your parallel axis theorem equation to the whole shape. I'm going to show you this can be a lot shorter, okay? So talking you through that process, and so this now is part B. And in part B, we want to say um, for... The entire body, we can also say that our ix is equal to our i bar sub x plus our area times our y bar of our elements squared. Okay, so if you think about what we know, we just solved for this, right? It's this value right here, 3.8 or sorry, 13.62. I also know my centroidal distance. It turns out that if we only have one body, we're really not talking then about the centroid of a subshape. We're talking about the centroid of the overall body. Okay, so I also know my area value, right? It was that number seven over here. And I also know my Y bar, because I just solved for it over here. Okay, so I have everything except for the thing I want to solve for, which is the moment inertia about the centroid. So I can reorganize this equation. Okay, so reorganizing, I solve now for i bar sub x. And it turns out that that is going to be equal to my i sub x about the given axes that I solve for above minus the area times y bar squared. Noting, as we said before, the moment inertia about the centroid is always smaller than the moment inertia about any other axis location. And so here, I bar x is not through the centroid, so we need to subtract off with using the parallel axis theorem a little bit of moment inertia and get a smaller value. So numerically, um, this works out to be... So my I bar X was 13.62 minus my, my areas times my Y bar squared, 0.58 squared. Let me just write this out. 13.62 minus the sum of areas, 10.858 times Y bar, 0.58. I'm gonna square that last term. That we end up with I bar X equal to 
meters to the fourth. And we can do the same thing for my i y is equal to i bar y plus a times x bar squared. Again, this is the equation for the overall body. Rearranging that, solving for i bar sub y is i sub y plus a x bar squared. Putting in those values, we end up with i bar sub y equal to a value of 12.07 meters to the fourth. Okay, so there are my answers for part B, noting that they were just a hair smaller than the answers to part A, just because the centroid wasn't that far from our given axes. Okay, the further your given axes is away from the centroid, the greater difference you have between those terms. And so just to review, this is a long problem, right? A 30 minute example, boom. We started off with dividing our shape, um, our overall shaded area into subshapes. Okay, we picked a overall rectangle, a triangle over here, and also a cutout quarter circle. If you'd picked a different assembly of, of shapes, you would end up with the same answers as long as you did all the computations correctly. Okay, then we went to our equation page, our table of shapes, and the different equations to go with them, and we picked off all of our moments of inertia about each centroid. Okay, um, as well as I pulled off here some centroidal distances um, for my quarter circle. Then I set up a table where um, row by row and, and column by column, I basically computed my areas, my distance to each the centroid of each subshape, and then I got into my computational columns, noting here for I bar X and I bar Y, I actually used these equations that were up top. Then I summed all the different columns that I needed for my future computations, some of my areas and some of all these other terms here, substitute the values into my equation, then solve for my moment of inertia, again, area moment inertia about the given x axis and area moment inertia about the given y axis. Finally, I thought about how I wanted to find the moment of inertia about the centroid. I could have set up a brand new table with brand new, the areas would have been the same. My X bar ELs and Y bar ELs would have been different. Therefore, all the other columns would have been different except for your moments of inertia about the centroids. Those two columns would have remained the same. But instead, I chose to look at the overall, the overall body and basically do my parallel axis theorem shift using my parallel axis theorem equation for the overall body, back solving for my i bar x and my i bar sub y. Thank you so much for your attention. I know that this was a long example. Feel free to go back and take a look at any parts that you need to. I believe in you and hope you're having a great day.